Hello everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. Thank you all for joining us for this conversation on digital technology on access to health, including SRHR services for women and girls with disabilities. This session is co-organized by Arrow and Women with Disabilities Development Forum, WDDF, Bangladesh. I'm Siva Tanendran, and I'm representing the Asia Pacific Resource and Research Center for Women, Arrow which is a global South feminist organization working on the issues of SRHR and its intersections with disability rights in this forum. Before we start the session, a few housekeeping announcements, right? The session is sign interpreted and closed captioned. We are also recording the session and this will be added into the UN webcast as part of the 59th session of the Commission for Social Development. And if you have any questions and comments, please put them on the chat box. About the Commission on Social Development 59. This session is being held on the sideline of the 59th session of the Commission for Social Development that is taking place in the UNHQ in New York from 8th of February and will conclude on the 17th of February next week. The Commission is the advisory body responsible for the social development pillar of global development. The priority theme of the 59th session is socially just transition towards sustainable development, and it looks at the role of digital technologies and social dis development and well-being of all. The theme is apt, especially in the context of current COVID-19 pandemic, which has pushed us to rely on digital mediums and platforms even for essential services. So the positive impact of digital solutions in the healthcare industry has proven to offer benefit healthcare services, staff, and uh, patients through a more seamless patient and hospital data management and records keeping and usage of social channels to address health concerns, especially through simple, simple mobile apps, to name a few. However, these benefits are not experienced by all due to the existing inequalities in health and digital literacy. People with disabilities face further inequities in accessing health services due to infrastructure that is inaccessible for people with physical disabilities and lack of facilities, for example, sign language interpretation. This is despite the fact that the UN Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, UNCRPD, specifies that state parties recognize that persons with disabilities have the right to the enjoyment of the highest attainable standard of health without discrimination on the basis of disability. This is worse for women and girls with disabilities in South Asia, whose SRHR needs and concerns are ignored and are often premised on harmful assumptions that construe women and girls with disabilities to be non-sexual, or on the other hand, hypersexual, and are invisibilized and robbed of agency to make decisions about their own bodies, sexuality, and lives including through practices such as forced sterilization, forced abortion, and forced institutionalization. Despite this urgent need for SRHR information and disability sensitive services, women and girls with disabilities face innumerable barriers in accessing SRHR information and SRH services. They face many barriers in accessing healthcare, including physical barriers in terms of inaccessible buildings and equipment and lack of affordable services and public transportation. More recently, we see attention to health infrastructure that is being developed to make it more accessible to persons with disabilities. Similar or more investment also needs to be made in digital literacy and making technology available to persons with disabilities to transform the landscape of healthcare that can significantly contribute to bettering the lives for all, especially persons with disabilities. This is especially important for women and girls with disabilities to have, for them to have access to informed choices and access to services. The COVID-19 lockdown has proved that this is necessary more than ever to enable a barrier-free access to essential health services and information for all. Also, in the rising parallel shadow pandemic of violence against women and girls, such transformation is also more important to allow for women and girls with disabilities who may be facing sexual and gender-based violence to seek instant medical attention and advice through the use of technology. In this context and keeping the priority theme of the 59th Commission on Social Development in mind, we are organizing this side event to discuss digital technology 
and its impact on the accessibility to health and SRHR services for women and girls with disabilities. This session will discuss the impact of digital advancement and that can improve accessibility to health services and sexual and reproductive health services for women and girls with disabilities, which is a very timely topic as the COVID-19 pandemic and the parallel shadow pandemic of rising sexual and gender-based violence against women and girls have made it imperative that information provided on these essential services are trans transparent, accessible, and affordable through delivery of services using virtual reality tools, wearable medical devices, telehealth, and 5G mobile technology. To discuss this further, we have a great lineup of speakers who are experts on the issue of the human rights of women and girls with disabilities. Our panelists will ex discuss examples from the South Asian region where digital technologies are transforming the landscape of the healthcare industry. Each speaker will share the experience of how digitalization of health services have been benefited or have not benefited women with disabilities and will discuss challenges and barriers in accessing healthcare services, including SRHR and risks posed by e-exclusion of persons with disabilities with little or no access to technology. The speakers will end with their recommendations for various stakeholders. So for as our very first speaker, we have Lakshmi, who's a young feminist from Nepal. She is the co-founder of Access Planet Organization that is committed to the rights and empowerment of women with disabilities. She advocates for technological empowerment, the improvement of quality education, and enhancing the career and professionalism of young women with disabilities. Lakshmi, the floor is yours. Thank you so much for the kind introduction. Greetings everybody. So I would like to begin uh, the presentation on the impact of digital technology on access to health and sexual and reproductive health services for girls and women with disabilities and I will be speaking from the perspective of Nepal. First of all, uh, as we already discussed that COVID-19 crisis have proven that it is necessary now more than ever, uh, barrier-free access to essential health services, including sexual and reproductive health related services. SRS services have often been inaccessible to girls and women with disabilities due to physical barriers, lack of disability related clinical services and stigma and discriminations to girls and women with disabilities in relation to SRH rights. But there is also the situation that there is now more information available to many people from diverse sources than ever. So on this background, firstly, uh, I'm going to talk about the situation of SRH of girls and women with disabilities in Nepal. The disability prevalence rate in Nepal is 1.94% according to the National Census 2011. Taking reference from WHO, reports, disability experts estimates the number to be higher in between 10 to 15 percent of the population, total population to have disability. Nepal ratified UNCRPD and its optional protocol in 2009, which ensures girls and women with disabilities have the same rights to make decision on their personal lives, health care, and reproductive, reproductive rights as any other citizens. Similarly, Act on the Rights of Persons with Disability, enacted in 2017, also focused on promoting SRHR of girls and women with disabilities in Nepal. There is a national guidelines on disability inclusive health services enacted in 2019 also states about the inclusive information and communication. It also focuses on disability inclusive SRH services. Despite these policies, girls and women with disabilities face multiple discriminations in terms of disability, gender, caste, ethnicity, and being amongst the poorest of the poor. 
women and girls with disabilities have been structurally denied information about SRHR. There is still the situation that they cannot freely establish relationship, cannot decide whether or when or with whom to have family or make family. They have been subjected to forced sterilization, forced marriage, and forced abortion. Denied access to SRS services to women and girls with disabilities have been exacerbated during COVID-19 crisis in Nepal. Regarding the use of technology on providing SRS services and information, it is very low and has, has not been practiced that much. And even those services which are technologically provided, less attention is given to girls and women with disabilities. There is no prioritized programs. So what are the challenges in digitalization of SRHR in Nepal? Firstly, local healing mechanisms are still popular in Nepal, creating barrier in digitalization of integrated health service related to SRHR. Similarly, they have, uh, the people have practiced seeing and hearing the doctors and expect the same in vice versa, which is also one of the critical challenges that's posed in the trust issue related to digitally available information. Similarly, there is no internet access everywhere, every time, and with the good service quality. Moreover, both the doctors and the patient or the uh, service seeker and service provider are not familiar uh, with the technology. Moreover, experts are not available during the emergency related to SRH which also creates the trust-related issue. I would like to share some of my experience on how digitalization of health services has benefited me as women with disability. I have uh, used a digital technology for overall health purpose, uh, mostly during the COVID-19 crisis period because it was locked down and radio, television, online was the major source of health-related information. Similarly, uh, I also use the digitally available SRH-related information, especially when I was abroad, especially in the non-English speaking country, where it was difficult for me to explain them about my SRH-related problem and therefore, Taking the doctor's appointment also takes lengthy process. So uh, digital information or SRHR was useful. Being a person with visual impairment, has, uh, digital information or SRHR has been useful for me due to the reasons such as like, I will get wide range of sources to verify with the problems and the way of treatment related to my SRHR issues. Secondly, many hospitals in Nepal are overcrowded. So it's difficult to visit alone being a person with visual impairment. And it's not feasible for me to manage someone to assist me every time. SRHS related issues uh, is also not the, like, is the matter of the privacy. So it's not comfortable all the time to discuss with attendant or my family members. Therefore, digital information related to SRHR has been very beneficial for me. Now, I would like to talk about what are the risks posed to the e-exclusion of persons with disabilities with little or no access to technology. In Nepal, girls and women with disabilities are less empowered technologically. Even if they get technology-related training, they do not have those devices to operate. Most of them belong to the poor of the poorest family and do not have access to internet facilities. Digital information system for uh, SRS related uh, services are made, uh, are made in Nepali language are very less. 
So most of the, the information are available in English and it is not comprehend, comprehensible to the girls and uh, women with disabilities who are semi-literate or illiterate. Even, even among the few services, there is no disability focused services related to digital SRHR. So for this, my recommendation to the stakeholders will be NGOs, organizations of persons with disabilities and the government should work on increasing digital literacy among girls and women with disabilities. Along with providing the training, government should subsidize them to equip with devices to access the technology. Digital information related to sexual and reproductive health services should be in Nepali language and other local languages. Health service providers in the rural settings must be equipped with technological skill and digital health related materials. Government should encourage and skill the service providers to develop their website following the web content accessibility guidelines and to make the SRH related applications friendly to diverse disabilities. There should be formation of a roster of the experts where there should be the representation of women with disabilities. To conclude, the concept of right to SRH is a right of progressive realization. So new technologies will continue to develop and impact in the way people make SRH related decisions. SRH services should be provided in Nepal in both old and new ways. Digital, digitalization of health services, especially by SRH uh, of this is beneficial for girls and women with disabilities in Nepal if it is done in proper way. So I would like to conclude that uh, being a Nepal, a country with lots of geographical and typological difficulties, like it's not always accessible and feasible for girls and women with disabilities to visit health centers or centers for uh, accessing the SRH rights. So in this regard, digitalization of SRH services is beneficial for Nepali girls and women with disabilities. Thank you. I will uh, welcome your questions and comments. Thank you so much, Lakshmi, for pointing out so many of these uh, barriers that continue to exist. And of course, to say that, you know, because of women and girls with disabilities from the part of the world that we are, there's already gender discrimination, especially, and uh, which, firstly, there's not equitable access between boys and girls to uh, technology, digital technology, and devices required for digital technology. And of course, when you add the lens of uh, disabilities, uh, this becomes even far more difficult, you know, for women and girls to navigate this uh, this this area. Uh, so our next speaker is Abia, who has the personal experience of physical disability. Uh, Abia Akram has been engaged in the disability movement since 1997. She has lobbied parliamentarians and UN high-level representatives focusing on developing advocacy strategies. She's the recipient of the Human Rights Presidential Award. It is among the th Chevening 35 change makers globally. So uh, Abia, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Thank you for giving me this opportunity to share the experiences of women and girls with disability. And especially when we talk about the concerns on the, from the global South, the impact on the rights of and the lives of women and girls with disability, it's so, so huge. And this is really important platform where we are talking about with the UN, state representative, international organizations, how important it is to talk about the sexual health and reproductive rights of women and girls with disability. We have uh, been working in the sector like right after the COVID response, we tried to communicate and organize a series of different consultations with women with disability. On Sorry, can, on the country level, 
of the regional and on the global level where we get the responses from different women and girls with disability on the impact of covid on their lives and this was really um, like shocking and sad to hear like women and girls with disabilities are the most vulnerable and they are the first one who got all the discrimination during this situation uh, uh, like 10 to 15 percent of the total population are persons with disability and 50 percent of them are women and girls with disability and more than 80 percent are still living in the rural areas so when we talk about the technology and the impact on the lives of women with disability, it was difficult to access because we have seen a complete gap between the digitalized gap between uh, the countries, between the populations, even within women with disabilities from the rural and the development organizations, how they were finding it difficult to access the, those technology and the services. Lakshmi have rightly mentioned, like it was because of the access to the resources and very limited like access to accessible formats of the technology. We have witnessed with those women with disabilities because we have done a survey with the service providers and at the same time with women and girls with disability. And we find out like many parents, they were praying that our daughters die before we die because nobody is going to take care of them. Nobody is going to give them the information about their sexual rights, how they can get the services of the health and facilities to them. So we just uh, try to negotiate with them and see what are the challenges they are facing. But at the same time, with the policy makers, with the service providers, what changes they can see and how they can incorporate within their plans. So the first thing which women with disabilities have identified is the gap like their voices are not included. They never been consulted what are their needs and how they are going to respond on their needs. If we are talking about the physical disabled woman, obviously they need the personal assistance services, they need uh, sign language interpreters, they need a uh, brain, all, all the videos, materials, which are need to be in the accessible formats, but they were finding it quite hard. We uh, have like uh, consulted with different organizations and started the virtual support network to provide the psychosocial support to women with disability. And also some uh, guidelines how to access the sexual health and reproductive rights. So we trained few women with disabilities with the connections of the mainstream organizations. Because Arrow have a very good example, like how the mainstream organization is taking in account the concerns of women and girls with disabilities. So in the same way we were doing on the country level, like how we can collaborate with the mainstream organization and make their programs inclusive. They have created a mobile application, which was the safety app in which they identified the areas where you can just provide the notification and you can get the police support, you can get the health uh, services, you can get all that information from where I need to get the wheelchair, from where I can consult with the doctor and all that uh, information in one application in an accessible format. But the reach out to that application was very small because everybody don't have access to the internet facilities they don't have the mobile phones so if we are getting into the creative solutions for accessing the information but still we have to provide them the proper allocations of the budget to the government initiatives because if the state is taking the responsibility of making their programs more inclusive then it's possible that the finance, man, um, uh, finance ministry can allocate a reasonable budget for this. They have the budget for providing the health services, but if it's not inclusive, then we can't say like it's for everyone. So that kind of engagement dialogues 
policy level change is really, really important. And also when we talk about the implementation, we need to engage directly the leadership of women and girls with disability. Without their engagement, without their leadership, it's not possible. We have seen like when we started in the country, context like I'm from Pakistan and we also see like from our country when we started talking about the sexual health and re rights of women with disability it was so difficult even within the disability community it was not acceptable and they were saying like why are you are talking about the sexual health so at that point we realized like this is really important to sensitize the community to media, to the practical examples of people, to sharing that information and also giving them the opportunities to contribute. And we, uh, from this platform, we can highlight that point, like it's very important to bring a collective voices of women with disability and creating clear guidelines for different sectors. Like if you're talking with the government, we have to have some toolkits, some checklists, and provide them with the solutions, with the examples. And at the same time, if we are talking about the disabled people organizations, we are talking about women with disability, they also need awareness on that. Like how you are going to address that issue on your country level, on the regional and the global. So we can see a positive change in the lives of women and girls with disability. Thank you. Abia, thank you for sharing some of these amazing uh, work that you all have been doing with the virtual support network, uh, as well as highlighting how difficult it is uh, to actually talk about SRHR uh, of uh, women and girls with disabilities because society likes to view them as being uh, asexual, you know, or hypersexual. And uh, we must not also forget that, you know, there's a diversity you know, of uh, sexual preferences and choices, you know, amongst even uh, people with disabilities, which also needs to be recognized. Um, so next we have uh, Misty Appa. Uh, Ashrafu Nahar Misty is a wheelchair user and is a founder and executive director of Women with Disabilities Development Foundation, WDDF in Bangladesh. She has extensive experience on the inclusion of dis disability rights in development plans and programs. And she is a women's rights activist committed to advancing the rights of women with disabilities and advocating for non discriminatory policies. Uh, Misty Appa, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you so much for your kind introduction uh, for me. Uh, thank you very much, uh, all the participants here today. Uh, today. Uh, good morning, good evening, whatever it is in your time now. Um, it is very important dialogue or discussion on the um, sexual and reproductive health rights for girls and women with disabilities uh, tonight for me, uh, because we believe that the sexual and reproductive health and rights is the concept of human rights applied to sexuality and reproduction. 16% of the age of 18, uh, and 14% of total pop population above uh, age of 18 in Bangladesh, uh, who is are really marginalized if we think uh, the uh, age or age situation uh, in Bangladesh. So this is huge number of adolescents and people, including with disabilities needed vast consideration for ensuring age or age and health well-being through digital service system and physical in direction to doctors, health professionals. I salute to Abhiya from, uh, from Pakistan and Lakshmi from Nepal that they um, highlighted the issues which is uh, almost similar in Bangladesh also for girls and women with disabilities. Uh, we must know uh, the SDGs go to ensure health, uh, health lives and promote well-being for all uh, at all ages, which consists the theme for all criteria and circumstances for all people, health will be. Uh, for this, uh, uh, ensuring this goal, we must not uh, be excluded or any personal identity sort of our sexual minority or having disability or ethnicity. So uh, we thinking that uh, we have to uh, highlight it. Where is our problem for the girls and many disabilities why they do not get uh, access uh, to uh, get the services from health uh, facilities with 
consist or existing in our country uh, level, uh, which is uh, existing in our community level, because uh, there is huge um, uh, initiative uh, from our government, uh, but uh, that is uh, absolutely inaccessible for uh, people with disabilities, especially girls and women with disabilities in the rural area. Uh, in COVID-19, we uh, see there is um, lots of initiative with, which is uh, first time in Bangladesh uh, ensuring that online uh, service system for the people with disabilities and also the other people who don't have disability but they can get services from their home. So uh, this is an indicator that the digital um, technology could be uh, provide uh, some sort of uh, facilities for the people who have uh, difficulties to go outside or get direct services from the hospitals or clinics. Department of Family Planning and Ministry of Health and Family Welfare of Bangladesh are trying to ensure youth and adolescent friendly health services in our country. Uh, very recently, both ministry consider disability friendly inclusive health services for all citizens of Bangladesh. Uh, Shirin Akhtar, Chairman of uh, Women with Disabilities Development Foundation, my colleague, is working now as a consultant for last three months for prepared uh, and disability inclusive standard operative procedures on HRAs and family planning. So this is an indicator that Bangladesh government is now uh, very much uh, positive to ensure uh, the disability rights and incorporate the disability issues in their policy frameworks. So it's remarks, um, it is a remarkable sign to use digital technology in Bangladesh for uh, uh, registration to get vaccine for protection from uh, COVID-19. Now we, we are uh, doing registration uh, before taking the vaccine from COVID-19. It was uh, on sports services and also it was the previous uh, registration facilities from the home. So. Um, uh, this make another indicators that uh, people with disabilities also get privileged uh, from this uh, um, uh, technology, uh, uh, technology services for health services. So uh, if Bangladesh government try to uh, make the facilities and services through digital uh, technology, it uh, could be somehow positive for people with disabilities, but there is also some um, uh, some uh, barriers or some challenges for people and uh, people and girls and women with disabilities, which is uh, already Lakshmi mentioned. I will mention also uh, similar things uh, next time. Now I want to um, uh, show uh, speed you about some progress in Bangladesh to incorporate disability issues in national health policy and also national strategy for adolescent health, 2017 to. 2030. So these two policies incorporate disability issues as well, but there is nothing about the digital technology services. Uh, so uh, I think that uh, in future, our government will take initiative for this uh, uh, digital technology services for health service. Regarding sexual and reproductive health service, government initiates some center for gate HRA services from directly. The community clinic, mother and child care center, maternity child health center, Upojila family planning service. This four uh, service center is not accessible for people, girls and women with disabilities. And there is there is huge gap um, because uh, people with disabilities, especially girls and women with disabilities, uh, do not have um, access and acceptance to get the services. Uh, because still there remains myth and discrimination for different style of public services related not only healthcare but also other provisions like rehabilitation, home bed, uh, home based hosp uh, hospitalities and facilities. So this is the uh, this is the lags uh, in our country that inaccessible environment make uh, some myth and discrimination against girls and women with disabilities. And also the uh, limitations uh, when the um, service provider provide their health uh, care system to uh, pe people, um, the citizen of Bangladesh, including HRHR. Because uh, the service center is not accessible, there is still negative attitude from health authors. Because the thing that the 
uh, women with disabilities not have uh, rights to give and birth even if any uh, girls uh, or women with disabilities become pregnant they shows that why you become why you interested to become a mother so this is the um, a very narrow mind uh, setup uh, in our health uh, uh, caregivers who are really and uh, not uh, aware about the rights on HLHR of girls and women with disabilities. There is there is different type of myths. Uh, uh, even uh, doctors uh, and health professionals they never think about the uh, girls and women with disabilities get even. Uh, the uh, general services, not HRHR. So uh, they think that uh, the uh, girls and women with disabilities will uh, stay in the home. They no need to go outside. They no need to go uh, health uh, uh, service center or they no, no need to get any services from their hospital. Because they think that the uh, people with disabilities or girls and women with disabilities are the different uh, human being. Uh, they, they can take the risk just and uh, they can get only rehabilitation services from the rehabilitation center. But you uh, can't imagine that Bangladesh have only one rehabilitation center uh, which uh, get uh, some government facilities and uh, continue their services with the uh, personal, um, uh, personal fees from the patients. So, so here in Bangladesh, uh, the uh, doctor fees also so high. Health uh, care, if you want to get uh, the health services from the hospital or clinic, the cost is very highly, which is not um, uh, in the uh, grip of uh, girls and women with disabilities, uh, especially who are living in the rural area. So uh, the facilities uh, is uh, are not, um, uh, the facilities is not for the girls and women with disabilities who are interested or who need actually the health service, uh, sexual reproductive health service from uh, the go government uh, center. So they need to go the uh, private sector, uh, private clinic, private hospital, and get some services from uh, the private uh, hospital or uh, clinics. So this is the situation in Bangladesh. Uh, I want to focus on some challenges of girls and women with disabilities to receive health services and sexual reproductive health service through uh, digitalization if in future. Uh, because most of women and girls with disabilities are living under poverty line and uh, status is ultra poor in the community. So they do not have uh, Android or a phone, even, even they don't have the button mobile phone. So how they will, they will get access from the digital, digitalized healthcare services uh, if uh, the government start uh, in future. Uh, even um, the, in the rural area, there is not have access in internet facilities. Uh, so this is also another challenges for not only girls and women with disabilities, but also, but also the um, women who are living in the rural areas. Uh, the, uh, in the, in, if the digitalization system uh, will not use the sign language or message, so uh, message to communicate with the patient, uh, then it will not be benefited uh, for the patient with hearing or speech impairment or the intellectual uh, girls and women with disabilities. Uh, I think that uh, if the digitalization system used, that must use picture and image related HR, HR uh, related information because uh, in our rural area, the community uh, people, they do not know about the sign language and uh, due to the illiteracy, the girls and women with disabilities do not understand the sign language, professional sign language, even in Bengali. Uh, so that is the, the another challenges uh, uh, for them. HR, HR uh, bulletin must be used different languages uh, for uh, the local contents for diversity disabilities because uh, there is different type of people. Uh, different type of uh, disability, there is different type of uh, situation in our rural area. Uh, I want to give some uh, recommendation which uh, is um, now I think very important, uh, need to multi-component strategy to improve access to service. Uh, there should be sex education in schools. 
uh, we have we have some um, sort of education system on the sexuality and reproductive health in our uh, school and colleges, but uh, teachers are not uh, given teach the, uh, the student in the schools. That is the uh, another myth in our country, or uh, I think that we there is taboo. So we have to break the taboo. Promotion of youth uh, friendly health clinic is very important for our uh, community. Uh, more and more research on HRHR disability and non communicable disease is important. Uh, I think that um, SRHR program uh, should uh, take for the girls and women with disabilities uh, for vast uh, awareness raising. Uh, and there should be uh, disability um, inclusive national HRHR policy. Uh, law and budget is very much important. Without budget, we could not able to uh, ensure, we could not able to um, give the SRS services for the people with disabilities. I want to conclude my um, speech here with a very uh, important and interesting news from our health minister. Yesterday, our health minister said that we will convert our health system in very fast uh, mode through using digital technology. Uh, through this uh, very important digital system, we will able to preserve the past disease history of each patient which will help him or her wherever she goes to get treatment. She will not face any difficulties or further treatment if she or he need. Besides this, our uh, ministry uh, said that besides uh, this, we, um, uh, we uh, face out our uh, resources to using or not. If the uh, machine is unused or failed, we can find out this. How many patients are coming to hospital with? Is their need? How is the mortality rate, etc.? We can understand from uh, the using technology, uh, digital technology system. This is the indicator that Bangladesh is going to. Um, uh, ensure the digital technology system for whole health service in a near future. It, it actually brings a symbolic change to me that Health Minister Honorable Minister Mr. Jahid Malik feel digital technology should be used in hospital to ensure the health support for health service receiver. Uh, thank you very much everyone to give me opportunity to brief discussion on the digital technology and impact on HRHR. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Misty Appa, for letting us know of all of the uh, uh, issues that are occurring in Bangladesh. And clearly, we can see now the threat, like kind of, uh, uh, which is common across the South Asian region. But uh, before we come to any conclusions about it, maybe we can invite Niluka. Niluka, who is uh, an educator, a researcher, and disability rights advocate based in Colombo, Sri Lanka. She's a visiting lecturer at the University of Kalania and the University of Colombo. She serves on the board of directors of Women Enabled International and the advisory committees of Aero, Hype Sri Lanka, and LIRN Asia, Lin Asia. Niluka, the floor is yours. Great. Thank you so much, Seva. I'm just going to share my screen. So, I mean, it's been wonderful to listen to the previous speakers because I think in terms of barriers to access when it comes to sexual reproductive health rights, there are a lot of commonalities within the region. Um, today, I'm going to look specifically at the impact of digital te technologies uh, on access to health, uh, especially in terms of its SRHR uh, from a Sri Lankan perspective. Um, so I think the first place to really start off there then is, you know, what is the context in Sri Lanka when it generally comes to health, healthcare services, uh, and also the government's role in providing health. Um, we have a universal um, healthcare system, which means mainly the government subsidizes uh, healthcare or provides free healthcare services to its citizens. Um, and because of this, I think uh, at a regional level, Sri Lanka has a generally high standard of living. Uh, and when you look at, you know, um, in terms of the human development indicators in our country, the general uh, life expectancy is about 77 years uh, with uh, a very low infant mortality rate of about 6.4 out of 1000. 
Um, as a person with multiple disabilities, I have heavily relied uh, on uh, the healthcare system in my country and really benefited from it. Uh, but then on the other hand, as in any other country, we also have a very strong private healthcare sector. Uh, so in terms of uh, large private hospitals, pharmaceutical companies, pharmacies, uh, which are generally uh, clustered around urban centers in Sri Lanka like Kalambu Gaul and Kandy. So while there are high-tech hospitals and advanced healthcare facilities in the private sector, they're not always available to people in rural uh, communities. Uh, there's some level of public-private partnership uh, in the healthcare industry. Uh, and also uh, we have the role of NGO actors, especially in terms of SRHR, the Family Planning Association of Sri Lanka and DPOs providing certain healthcare services as well. Uh, the reason why I highlighted this is because if you look at the public health system and the private health system, it's almost like we have two very different health economies uh, in Sri Lanka. Um, when we talk of digital health, we are basically looking at how mobile technology, right? Uh, wearable devices, uh, telephones, uh, Zoom, Skype, uh, Facebook, social media, how all these kind of different digital technologies can be used in order to deliver healthcare services and attain healthcare outcomes. And I think in Sri Lanka with, uh, you know, uh, an aging population with the impact of war over time, with the impact of disease, and I'll talk about, you know, the impact of COVID as well. And also this increase in health seeking behavior with, you know, an increase in income levels has led to uh, a real interest in uh, digital health technologies. Um, so I first start with the non Health, state health sector, um, I think when we look at our region, South Asia in general, there's a high level of mobile ownership and usage. So in Sri Lanka, the mobile ownership is about 45 to 50%. Um, and um, that doesn't necessarily mean that all these users have smartphones, uh, but um, many people uh, have access to some form of mobile technology. In terms of the private sector and the uh, kind of the digital health options available, you know, we have uh, quite a few services that are provided by mobile companies. So for example, I have put Doc 990, it's, a, it's provided by a mobile company called Dialogue and their competitor, uh, Mobitel then offers another service, which is e-channeling, right? With all these um, kind of mobile-based apps and platforms, persons with disabilities and others are able to make uh, appointments to meet doctors. Uh, they can get prescriptions. They can uh, get, uh, you know, telescreening, telemonitoring, um, and telediagnosis uh, options. And um, they are also able to kind of access um, related health services like physiotherapy or uh, any other rehabilitation based therapy through their mobile phones, which is quite significant. But what I have to highlight here is that all these providers are private sector providers. So it's not captured in the free education public sector. Uh, and um, it also means that people who would access those technologies have to incur not just the cost of their data and the phone and technology, but also the cost of paying for these private providers. Um, so uh, in that sense, it, it in and of itself, it, given that it's a private sector uh, oriented uh, kind of uh, version of digital health technologies, it, it leads to the ex exclusion of many people and especially women and girls with disabilities who are generally from a low income background. Um, and uh, the, the amazing thing is, I mean, if you can afford it, you know, it's, it's really convenient. You have, you know, um, you can call up, get people to come to your home to take your blood tests um, and, you know, have, um, for me as a person with a psychosocial disability, you know, I've used it to have uh, online um, counseling sessions um, and uh, online even physiotherapy sessions. My mom uses it quite frequently. So that option is there if you have the money and if you're coming from a wealthier background, right? Uh, and with COVID, what has happened is that this technology that was traditionally used by people who sought 
uh, treatment in private healthcare facilities became uh, used by a much larger segment of population. And the other thing is what happened with COVID is that a lot of these private uh, mobile app, uh, health, digital health providers um, kind of started collaborating with the government, especially for COVID uh, related um, healthcare provision, right? So um, in terms of, again, that whole facility of uh, mobile prescriptions, mobile uh, delivery of medications, the government partnered with these companies and they offered it at a national level through the free uh, healthcare or, or the government sponsored healthcare system in the country. Uh, and I think for a lot of persons with disabilities, especially women with disabilities, we talk about access gaps, right, in terms of transportation barriers, in uh, terms of communication barriers. This really worked. Uh, we've done some studies, uh, consulted women with disabilities, and what's significant is that e this kind of service was offered not just in the major urban centers, but in many of the rural locations, including the north and east of the country, that has traditionally been excluded from a lot of these development and tech initiatives, which is fantastic, right? Um, in terms of the Family Planning Association of Sri Lanka, which I you know, uh, mentioned uh, earlier about, uh, they've got this... Um, uh, you know, you can order contraceptives online through their website. Uh, and similarly now, you know, uh, there are applications like Pick Me. So it's similar to Uber, but they do other kinds of deliveries in addition to the taxi rides. And they also now have, you know, access to people who want to kind of get contraceptives and because of the shame and stigma and not, you know, being able to uh, kind of <laughs> go to a pharmacy and get it, you have this option now of uh, ordering uh, online and also getting it uh, right to your home, right? Um, Family Planning Association as a non-government uh, organization uh, has been really uh, fantastic with providing trilingual information uh, and also, you know, pro providing a safe space for people who need that. And digital technologies has have been really used, especially with this QR scanner concept by the government of Sri Lanka to monitor COVID uh, in terms of public symptoms. So it is used uh, quite widely in the public health sector as well. In terms of the public sector, uh, digital health technologies, um, uh, have been used to uh, kind of centralize their um, service provision, right? And this has, over the past couple of years, even prior to COVID, led to minimizing overcrowding, reducing waiting lines. It's very hard for persons with disabilities to, you know, stand in waiting lines for hours. So this kind of um, mechanism has already been in place leading up to COVID, which worked well from the Sri Lankan experience, right? Uh, and I'm really happy to say that one of the major centers for the digitization initiative of the government of Sri Lanka was the North and East, where 40 government-run uh, hospitals in the North and East were uh, digitized, right? So obviously, like I said before, for women and girls with disabilities, right? This kind of uh, mobile base, primarily mobile base, but also, you know, online internet base and telephone base um, service provision, especially in the context of COVID, um, became uh, quite uh, beneficial. Right, uh, and also in terms of uh, access to contraceptives, uh, I can remember during COVID, you know, there was also a lot of very interesting collaboration within social media networks. So initially, when we had a lot of the information on COVID coming out, uh, it wasn't uh, really accessible to uh, people who were sign language users, right? So people in the deaf and hard of hearing community. And the initial response was on Facebook for people who were like sign language interpreters to start kind of interpreting uh, government uh, information bulletins on social media. So people have been really creative like that. Uh, you know, uh, I think one of the speakers said that during COVID, when we look at the whole concept of basic goods, right? Uh, contraceptives and uh, sanitary napkins right menstrual products were not seen as basic goods and then you know for especially women with disabilities accessing that became very difficult and that's when um 
the, the social media networks uh, were used to really effectively respond to those needs, right? Um, and, and if you think of like, especially for persons who are from the deaf community in Sri Lanka, even going to uh, a doctor for sexual reproductive, you know, health related uh, healthcare services, the whole concept of privacy when there is an interpreter there, you know, uh, becomes an issue. And it has been pointed out by uh, some of the women we interviewed, you know, um, and how can we use this kind of mobile technology to kind of uh, get either remove the need for the intermediary or to actually have translation applications. So the universities I work with are really trying to come up with new applications that will enable, you know, uh, um, that kind of, to, to enable people to bridge that communication back, gap uh, and, and hopefully that will lead to uh, great access uh, in the long run. And obviously, like the other speakers said, you know, we have the digital divide. Um, uh, one of the people we interviewed, one of the women said that, you know, everyone is now online. Education's online, work's online, health is online, <laughs> relationships are online. And usually in a household, especially low income, if you have one phone or one computer and limited data, the women with the disabilities will be the last people to get access to it, right? Usually it's, you will, uh, so the one of the participants uh, in, in a previous kind of uh, research study we did said that if you have a boy in the house who's going to school, that boy is probably going to get priority to access to these kind of technologies over everybody else, you know, including the girls in the house. And definitely, you know, the, the last in, in the kind of the pecking order would be women and girls with disabilities. One thing is, though, although it's been effective, this is not really a long term solution to the gaps in the ecology of access we have, you know, in terms of uh, on site treatment, because that's still a reality. And uh, I must say, in the Sri Lankan experience, the whole concept of a lack of uh, sign language interpretation, especially for deaf women who want to access uh, sexual reproductive health rights, remains one of the key concerns, right? And, and uh, the other thing, especially again among deaf, deaf women, their literacy rates are very low, which also means that digi digital literacy is low, you know, in terms of uh, opportunities for access. So given this general picture, the recommendations we need to like look at is uh, we need to address the digital uh, divide, right? And to think, think of how, okay, maybe we can't give like laptops and smartphones to everyone, but how can we get community level Level healthcare actors to be part of this process. I was really happy to read an article earlier today about, uh, you know, in rural environments where pharmacists act as uh, agents for, you know, kind of uh, booking uh, appointments like doctor's appointments through their mobile phones or you know uh, sending uh, requests for prescriptions through their mobile phones so the community pharmacist becomes like a facilitator so we need to think of okay how do we uh, look at the the rural officers the pharmacists you know the community health workers and how can we integrate them to this whole provision of uh, digital health services especially when it comes to women and girls with disabilities the need to you know innovate to have, uh, you know, more affordable smartphone technology. Um, and also, you know, uh, if we can sustain these kind of COVID related innovations of delivering medication, right, of the digital prescription culture that has emerged, is this something we can you know, sustained in the long run uh, for the benefit of everyone, not just women and girls with disabilities, right? Uh, and also when we design these uh, apps, if we can have universal design, you know, for all, and especially with women and girls with disabilities in mind, as you know, a, a key feature of any form of digital health service um, app. Or, or platform or service. Um, really, we need to rethink the uh, role of social media, but again, with fake news and things like that, it's a bit tricky. But with the COVID experience, especially in the Sri Lankan context, it played a very vital role in terms of uh, access to uh, you know, much needed uh, goods as well as information and services, right? Um, we, we need to uh, get on board the momentum that COVID has created for more public-private partnerships in the country and really, really invest uh, very seriously in increasing the digital literacy of persons with disabilities and especially women and girls with disabilities. So that's just a general overview and uh, happy to answer any questions if anyone has questions. 
Thank you so much, uh, Niluka. Uh, and now uh, we go to the question and answer uh, session. Uh, we do have some questions. Uh, let's see. Um, okay. So, uh, Ms. Tiapa, maybe you can uh, take this question. Uh, and uh, I think because also, Niluka, you also talked about health workers. So, you can add on after Ms. Tiapa. Uh, what role do health workers, uh, what role can they play to ensure the access of sexual and reproductive health services to people with disabilities in the context of digitalization of services? <laughs> Uh, actually, uh, now in Bangladesh, uh, a digitalized system is not ensured yet, but uh, uh, manually it is providing. Uh, the health service provider, they do not understand that, how uh, handle the patient with disabilities who have uh, intellectual disability or sign language uh, uh, users uh, or other multiple disabilities. So uh, when we will ensure the digital system, we could uh, ensure some um, uh, thematic uh, information, image, uh, pictures, uh, then and also uh, including sign language and messages. Then the um, uh, who have more vulnerability, they can understand that how they could help the um, uh, health service receiver. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I'll just add in there. So it's very interesting because for, uh, from a Sri Lankan perspective, uh, I feel like digital health technologies is uh, kind of helping in the process of centralizing med uh, medical records, uh, you know, in terms of uh, reports. And, and then there is this access then that technically uh, people from across the health sector should have, right? So when it comes to community level health uh, service providers, I think it's very important that they act as kind of nodes uh, of uh, care within the community. Um, so this is in terms of the formal health sector. The other thing, like I mentioned earlier, is uh, how can we ensure that community level, you know, like pharmacists, for example, right, or physiotherapists, how are they also integrated into this framework? Like in the Sri Lankan situation, like I mentioned, pharmacists are the ones who are actually making these appointments for people who do not have access to mobile health care for services, for example, right? So who else within communities, if this digital divide is a big issue, right? And access to technology is a big issue. Who else at the community level can we involve in order to act as a facilitator, right? So I think that facilitation role is something also that we really need to seriously look at and also look at the role played by organizations of women's and women and girls with disabilities and DPOs, you know, in the in that whole uh, service uh, delivery or health seeking uh, process in terms of the, the large approach to um, digital health technologies. Thank you, Neluka. Uh, so Abhya, we have a question for you coming from Santosh, who wants to know, how do we reach out to people who are not able to access to internet and digital technology with that virtual support network that you were talking about? Yeah, thank you so much. Um, I would say again, that Neluka and Misty have already mentioned that we have a very strong network of the disabled people organizations all over the country. So they are the first one we are of approaching them. And they have the data also for how many persons with disabilities are in contact in that province or on the district level even. So we can provide them the information. We train 300 women with disability uh, through digital uh, like technology and the trainings. And after that, they are the one who are going to, to the provinces and uh, the local areas and providing that information in accessible formats and talking to them through the peer counseling support to talking to the family members. Um, the second thing we are also using the polio workers and uh, the health workers who are going door to door and have access to many of the houses there so they can get that support. But now we are talking again like with the government officials and we're very lucky like now during the COVID response, we also got approval of our uh, disability rights bill 
So we have established the committees and the council on the rights of person with disability. So through that government initiatives also, we are highlighting that like it's very important whatever you are planning on the grassroots level, you have to make sure like the responses for person with disability, especially women and girls with disabilities, uh, sexual health and reproductive rights need to be addressed there. So that's the two way uh, approach we are taking one hand the leaders with disabilities need to be trained. And on the other hand, the service providers, their policies, their strategies need to be reviewed so they can work together on that. Yes, thank you so much, uh, Abhya. And then I have a uh, question to Lakshmi, uh, which is uh, the person says like, you know, one of the reasons that uh, technology adoption is so, is a challenge is because uh, the focus is too much on developing the technology and instead of the uh, not demonstrating the usefulness of it to the intended user. So have you experienced something like this? And do you have any suggestion on how, you know, a uh, low cost demonstration of the technology use uh, would make it perhaps uh, more accessible? Yes, thank you for the questions. and. Uh... Uh, for uh, for this, like firstly, uh, we should have to like identify those uh, like those who has who have posted the information or those system or a person who is going to uh, post the information using some technology. Like they should identify uh, the level of the participant, like uh, a literacy level or. Uh, which uh, language does she understand? So on the basis of that, only those uh, like technology or can be adopted as like I discussed uh, in the presentation as well. Like if a, a user understand different like ethnic language or uh, some local language, then the, the, the similar platform of language, like similar uh, language should be uh, used in the platform and obviously like uh, uh, there is the trend that uh, in every like websites or such like application systems like there is a trend uh, like trend of making it like colorful or like that but uh, more like more should like more should focus should be given in the accessibility aspect whether it's accessible to uh, users like with print disabilities or whether it is uh, in the uh, in the version which is read readable easy to read for the intellectual disabilities whether there is a captioning for the uh, person uh, who are deaf so uh, this should be given priority and uh, uh, yeah, obviously, like high tech, uh, rather than high tech, like uh, for informing or for the digitalization of SRHR services, especially for the girls and women with disability in the context of our region, like uh, low tech and those types of technology with the local languages and with the accessibility features uh, can be prioritized. Thank you. Thank you, Lakshmi. Um, and then we have uh, two questions from Niluka. For Niluka, uh, one is uh, from Prakriti, who asks uh, to make SRHR services uh, accessible at a wider scale, especially to disabled women and girls. Private sector participation cannot be ruled out. Also, they may bring more innovation to the digital platform. So. What kind of measures can governments take in order to ensure more inclusiveness and in access to such services by private sector providers? Um, that's a fantastic question, actually. And I think one of the reasons why uh, digital health technology, especially mobile-based technology has really taken off is because we've had private mobile uh, service providers uh, very proactively competing uh, at that level, you know, so we, we had e-channeling that came first with Mobitel and then the competitor came up with something a bit better with, you know, multiple modes of accessing doctors and medical services. So sometimes like, let, let's get the competition to work for us, right? Uh, and, uh, and the other thing is that in terms of uh, accessibility features, right, that's something that the government could, you know, in, try to provide incentives uh, in terms of, you know, grant making uh, 
uh, or in terms of uh, preferential, like when it comes to tenders, right? When it comes to providers who provide then those services for the government sector to make uh, accessibility and inclusion uh, an integral part uh, of the technologies that they procure, right? So it then it part, becomes part of the, the like almost the, the supply chain mechanisms. If we can build it into those kind of mechanisms in the long run, then we ensure that the kind of technologies that we create uh, are accessible. And also I think it's important to um, get the universities involved in terms of the, the innovation process, right? Uh, because there are, like, especially in our region in India, there are some fantastic apps that are coming out, like uh, especially for um, you know sign language interpretation. It's something that we are trying to really do here in Sri Lanka as well uh, at a university level. So in addition to the private actors to get you know uh, even the private universities on board uh, in order to kind of really invest uh, and the thing the beauty about uh, universal design is that you know we like for example we use text-to-speech software right um we we have like the hands-free technology a lot of this came actually as technologies for persons with disabilities but at the end of the day all of us like use it like even whatsapp we leave like voice messages right so if we can also get companies to think of uh, access as not as this special issue for persons with disabilities but is as something that makes uh, functionality easier for all of us you know that is also good so i think it's a great question and a great idea and i think that public private collaboration is very important and that's actually what we have really learned from the sri lankan experience yeah. um, and also the next question also goes to you niluka um, so it comes from nas hi niluka i was interested to hear about such diverse examples from sri lanka on access what sort of resource allocation do you think it is, nece is necessary for other countries to ensure greater accessibility and reduce the digital divide? Yeah, that's, that's a good question. And I think it connects back to the previous question, right? One of the things I think Sri Lanka has done right is to have a private public approach to uh, digital health technologies. Um, and uh, uh, so I think that's one way of looking at it in terms of uh, like budget allocations. I think in Sri Lanka, it's about uh, the budget allocation for health is about 3.8% of GDP. So although we still have free, you know, healthcare, it's not like we have a massive budget for it. Uh, but um, I, I think more than budgetary allocations, I think it's in terms of uh, commitment to like if we if you can have a regulatory framework in place like i mentioned earlier right where accessibility features are inbuilt into it right that is very helpful um i know we have like a policy that's coming up on e health uh, service provisions uh, so uh, so to get the regulatory framework um in line with this accessible digital health technologies would be useful. Again, I don't think like, especially again, if we get the private sector on board, right? Then the cost factor also through the, hopefully the competitive uh, market be kind of resolved. But that said, I am sad and I have to say, I'm coming from a place of privilege, right? Because that kind of approach doesn't address the fact that most of these uh, services are through the private sector and that means they're at a cost and that means that not all women with disabilities will be able to um, approach or, or you know access it so yeah but uh, but I think uh, we've had some great innovation in our region and it's something that's quite doable. Thank you so much for such a rich and insightful discussions. I think that we also had a lot of thanks coming from uh, different people who joined us uh, during this uh, uh, conversation in the chat. Um, so as a conclusion, maybe, you know, I mean, there's so many conclusions to draw, but on the overall, I mean, we can see that the way, especially post COVID-19, that, you know, digital transformation and advancement and adoption right, is an important development to improve accessibility to essential health services, including to uh, sexual and reproductive health services for persons with disabilities and women and girls with disabilities in particular, right? And then the digital delivery uh, of health services is also a means of sustainable form of development as it conveys information and services in a way that perhaps is 
more affordable and more free from stigma and discrimination and it's accessible. However, we need to also recognize that uh, even in persons with disabilities, there are uh, different other different factors, right? The other intersections with like uh, class and income and then the urban rural uh, uh, divide as well, which actually may see that some persons, uh, especially women and girls, uh, who may be left out of that access conversation altogether. Uh, and then existing uh, gender norms in uh, society also, you know, uh, are a barrier in that regard. Um, and then, of course, I think one was this uh, amazing thing is that collaboration from all stakeholders, right, private, public, community, in order to make this inclusion a reality is something that's uh, very important. And, you know, I really like, especially the last thing that you said, Niluka, I mean, like when we make universal design, I mean, we may think that, you know, uh, creating something for persons with disabilities only serves persons with disabilities, but actually, no, it benefits all of us you know, and it makes all of our lives easier and we can all use that technology. So uh, that, that kind of uh, perspective that we're not creating something small for a small group of people, but rather we are, this is going to actually make accessibility easier for all of us, right, on so many different scales. So I think that, uh, you know, it was, uh, thank you so much. Uh, I would like to say to all of our wonderful speakers uh, for that, um, you know, firstly, or for that, invaluable work that all of you are doing on the ground and then of course spending this time to also share with all of us you know what those experiences have been but uh before i kind of uh, close this session i have a request uh from bifu and all if we can all switch on our uh cameras for at least the panelists and so that uh they can take a, a kind of a group shot of us so lakshmi do you think you can uh, switch on your camera also Yeah. So, but uh, Keisha, Momota, Bipu, you want to switch on? I mean, they all are like, appearing like black boxes. And what happened to our other uh, sign language interpreter? There's another one, right? Um, Shruti. Ah, yeah, yeah. Surbi. Yeah, Surbi. Yeah, here. Yeah. Okay. Lakshmi. Oh, maybe she. Ah, there you are. Hi. Okay. So, Keisha, you want to take the photograph and then you tell us when you are. Yeah. Okay. Thank you so much. We take it. Okay, so I'm I'm really hopeful that um, actually that uh, you know the Commission on Social Development is going to take you know some of these really important points uh, in order to make the recommendations uh, for the governments to take on board with regards uh, access to digital technology and uh, how it can be useful in the area of gender and of course for women and girls with disabilities. Thank you so much for everyone. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank, Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Thank you.